joining us today for a worship. Um, it's a beautiful day to be in the house of the Lord. So if you are vaccinated and have your mask on, remember that you can sing out. Let the Lord know that you love him and that we are here to serve him. Uh, also, this week is the Annie Armstrong offering week and um, for foreign missions. So at our uh, kiosk out here, you can grab an envelope that you can donate to the, um, sorry, Lottie Moon. <laughs> Um, it's Christmas time. Uh, Lottie Moon offering. Uh, and also there is a guide for the week of prayer that you can grab. And it'll, it'll walk you through um, what we can do to pray for our, foreign, our international missions and everything like that this week. So thank you all for joining us and sing along.
a cynical man. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can be. Lay down your burdens, lay down your shame. All who are
This year has really spun past us so quickly. And now we've come upon the Advent season, which is um, the four Sundays before Advent, um, before Christmas. And Advent in Latin means coming. So during this time, we want to prepare our hearts to celebrate Jesus coming as a baby during the Christmas, around the Christmas season, and also his second coming, to prepare for his second coming. And to do that, we use the the candle around the, the advent wreath and the different colors you see are going to be lit up every week and they represent hope peace love and joy and then on christmas eve we light up the white candle which represents jesus because he's the light of the world i want to share with you a scripture from Isaiah 9, 6 and 7, for it says, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of the government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever the zeal of the lord almighty will accomplish this so during this advent we just want to invite all of us to just set our minds off all the stresses and busyness of this season that always comes and just focus on the gift of god jesus christ his son and now we want you to meet our advent family Good morning. Uh, we're the Shiosaki family. Uh, I'm Kevin. Uh, that's my wife, Maui, and uh, it's our son, Gavin. Oh. <laughs> Today, we light the first Advent candle of hope. Uh, let's, let's pray as before we light it. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I just thank you. Now, for all of us here who know the hope of Jesus, Lord, there's, 
so many people out there and even within our church or people that we know and as we know how, how much you love us Lord and how you seek and you give us things that are priceless like hope and um, even in situations that seem difficult help us to remember how you've been faithful to us and help us to just pass that same grace and um, peace to other people during this time. Help us to be maybe more loving, even if people are rude. Because, pe- you know, I think people are suffering out there, Lord. Help us to see people through your eyes. Um, and help us to also just daily thank you for all the blessings that you give us. And these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. church family. Uh, I hope you guys had an amazing uh, Thanksgiving and you've somewhat recovered from perhaps the busiest shopping weekend uh, of the year. I hear, um, you know, the news had shared that it was a very good week for, uh, for businesses, so I'm assuming that it was a very fruitful time for shoppers. And so I hope that you guys had a chance to recover from that. But you know, this morning we are we're going to begin a new series of of talks entitled "A Christmas Story," in which we're we're looking at the different stories within the Christmas story itself. You know, today we're going to start off you know start it off with with a story of of faith, and to do so, I, I want us to take a look at Zachariah's story. You know, and so we, when we do that, I, I'd like for us to kind of look at first what's behind the story. And to do so, let me give us a, a little background info because I, I think it's important that, that we start there. In fact, Luke, you know, as he writes his gospel, he affirms this as he begins his, his gospel, you know, with these words found in verses 1 to 4. So let me read that for us. <clears throat> it starts out, verse 1 says this. Many have undertaken uh, to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us from those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus so that you may know the certainty of things you have been taught. You know, before we move on, some of you might be thinking, you know, who in the world is this most excellent Theophilus, right? You know, and, and so well, although there are a lot of assumptions out there, it, it seems most likely that, you know, Theophilus was this high-ranking or influential um, Gentile for whom Luke wanted to provide, you know, this this detailed historical account of Christ and the spread of the gospel throughout the Roman Empire. So, you know, he, he's kind of writing this kind of t- for him. And now with this explanation, you know, the next words, as we kind of move down to verse 5, the next words found in the first half of, of the verse are, are kind of key. It says right here, verse 5, the first part, in the, in the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah. Now here, Luke, he introduces us to, to Zechariah. You know, and Zechariah is a, a priest in the temple. And now before we jump into the whole background info, let me just preface this. 
you know, with the fact that, you know, Zechariah, he's, he's a priest, he's, he's married, he, you know, his wife is Elizabeth, and the two of them, they, they don't have any kids. Now, this is kind of an important detail to, to kind of remember here. You know, they had always wanted children, but this, they, were, they were kind of getting old. You know, they thought those days were, were behind them, right? You know, and, and actually most scholars, they, they, put, they put Zechariah and Elizabeth somewhere in their, in their late 80s, which by most accounts, right, you know, are, is, puts them well beyond their childbearing years. So this is kind of the, the deal here. This was their story, but a new story for the two of them is about to be written. And it's a story of faith. Now, so going back to Zechariah, who was a, a priest in the temple. Now, now priests back then, they, they were expected to serve um, in the temple at least sometime in, in their life. Okay? You know, it wasn't like, you know, like here, you know, you're called to a church and, and you're here week in and week out, you know. Because back then there were a, a, a good number of priests. There were quite a bit of them, right? And, and so the, what, how they would determine who would, who would serve at the temple would be they would, they would draw lots, right? You know, and, and for lack of better words, as they draw these lots, it would it would determine, you know, who would receive active duty, who would be able to actually kind of serve in the temple on that given time, you know, and, and you know, they also, there was also the deal where a, a priest would bring the, the, um, the incense into the holy place. This was an extra duty. This was another thing that you would have to figure out who would be doing this, but, but this was the deal. Zechariah had kind of drawn the lots. He kind of he kind of got the, won the lottery, got to serve or do this active duty to go into the temple, but he also did double duty. He, he also was responsible for bringing the incense into the temple, into the holy place, right? So this is the scene, right? Now, everything is pretty, pretty normal up until this point. He goes in. <clears throat> now, as logic would tell us would be as one goes in, then they, they should come out, right? You know, I mean, that's just kind of the normal thing, right? People just don't go in and don't ever come out again. So this day, one would think they would go in <clears throat> and in a timely manner, they would come out. But Zechariah doesn't come out at least right away. And so, you know, because he took quite a bit of time in there, you know, the people outside, they were getting a bit worried. You know, they, they start praying because they don't know what in the world is going. They kind of just walk on in and just kind of figure out, uh, do we need to call 911? Do we need to do CPR? You know, that, that one the deal. So, you know, they're outside, they're waiting, they're trying to figure out this whole deal. They're, you know, and so they do what they feel they, they know what to do. They, you know, they will pray. Let's just win in doubt, let's pray. And, and so they're outside praying because they, they don't know what's going on. But on the inside, you know, Zechariah, he, he meets an angel who later reveals himself as Gabriel, the angel, right? You know, and he, Gabriel, was there to let Zechariah know that his prayers had been answered, okay? You know, and, and, and so... You know, and these prayers were specific, right, early on in their life because they, again, they had no kids, right? I told you that's kind of an important detail to kind of tuck away back in the, the back of our heads. They had no kids. They had wanted kids. But my guess is these prayers were fired off some decades earlier, right? And, and, and so now here they are. Oh, here he is actually, right, in, in there. Gabriel is saying, your prayers have been answered. And this is kind of overwhelming for Zechariah. 
you know. And he's pretty shocked by the, the whole visitation from the angel deal, right? You know, and, and he's a priest at all, but this is still not in the norm. In fact, this isn't in the norm for, for most of the priests. They, they, you know, they go in there, they do their thing, and they come back out. This wasn't a common occurrence. So in this anything but, but normal encounter here, the angel tells Zechariah that the Lord was going to give Elizabeth and he a child. The shock, I think, you know, kind of as I, as I read through this, you know, I'm kind of trying to picture this. I think the shock turns into disbelief. You know, first the shock of the angel, then, you know, hey, Congratulations, you're going to be parents. You know, t- turns into this disbelief, and Zechariah begins to kind of question the whole encounter here, right? You know, and, and, and that was just, you know, this wasn't just a question of inquiry, you know, but one of, of doubt. And even kind of probing, looking, asking for a sign, you know, a, a show of, of proof. And, you know, I, again, just that itself, because I remember, you know, when, when, you know, I don't know how it is with you guys, but when I was younger, you know, in, in, in school, elementary school, going all the way up, right? If, if someone told you something and you, you did not believe what they were saying, you know, most kids, and I think they still say, but, but, you know, oh, show proof then, right? You know, I want proof. I, I don't believe you. You know, you're saying this. I, I'm hearing it, but I'm not believing it. Show me proof. You know, and, and, and in essence, that's what's going on here. Gabriel is saying, this is the deal, man. Your prayers have been heard. They've been answered. And let me just tell you, hey, the, congratulations. And Zechariah is, is stunned. But he's, there's this disbelief. You know, take a look at verse 18. In chapter 1 of the Gospel of Luke, verse 18 says this, Zechariah asked the angel, how can I be sure of this? I am an old man and my wife is well along in years. Now because Zechariah doubted, now, and, and, and not just an internal doubt, because yeah, most of us, we, we get that, right? We, we, we kind of we may be in conversations, we'll hear something, man, I don't believe it, I keep it on the inside, not hearing it, not believing it, not even going to entertain this thought, but it's on the inside. This was not on the inside, this kind of came out, and, and so he is saying, it's like not even, it's like sometimes when I think things, and it comes out, I, I even have to question, did, did that just come out of my mouth? Right, you know, because we, we, we think it and, and, and we may have doubt, but you know, I'm not gonna. But right here, it's this is kind of one of those times where I'm thinking, he's thinking it, and as he's thinking it, these were how can I be sure? Man, you're talking about a, I'm old and my wife is old. I mean, that's kind of the deal there, that's what he's saying, right? You know, and, and, and and so because he doubted, again, not just an internal doubt, but this, you know, if this was to be, he wanted a sign. You know, he said, he wanted, show me proof to give me something. So the angel gives Zechariah a sign. Probably not the sign he wanted, right? And the sign is that he would be at the very least right? Not able to speak until the baby was born. You know, again, there's a lot of things that kind of you can read into this. Maybe Elizabeth was happy about this. I don't know. But, but, but I say at the very least because there are, there are scholars that believe that his hearing, not just his speech, but his hearing was taken away during this time. But, but again, at the very least, his speech, his ability to communicate was gone. You know, take a look at, at verse 20. It kind of outlines what, what's going on here. Verse 20 says, and now you will be 
silent. And, and this is why, you know, most scholar, many scholars think that, that he was deaf also because of the redundancy. Because it starts off with, you will be silent. And then goes on to say, and not able to speak. Okay? And not able to speak until the day that this happens because you did not believe my words which will come true at their appointed time. Now this, it, it sets the scene for the next nine months. You know, we, we're not sure all that goes on in those nine months, but and finally, we, we see what happens, right? You know, and finally, you know, his acting in faith, you know, Zachariah's acting in faith by naming his son John, okay, as instructed to do um, earlier in verse 13. It's at this point that Zechariah has given back his speech and, and perhaps his hearing. All because of his faith. Now I love what, what happens next because there's this song that's brewing right in him. Hadn't spoken a word for nine months. I don't know if you've ever done anything like that. Um, one of the, the first positions that I had was serving at a church um, as an associate, overseeing their education, discipleship, and students. And I remember I had this great idea that I would bring a bunch of Baptist Sunday school teachers to a Benedictine monastery, you know, that we would spend the day in silence. And I can tell you that it was an epic fail because by 12, everybody had had it already. They just wanted, they were just talking and the whole silent thing just didn't work, you know. One hour was just rough, you know. And so just imagine here, nine months without the ability to communicate. See, and so what happens next is there's this song that's brewing inside Zachariah's heart. And, and, and what was inside, right, inside of him has now exploded externally with this deep sense of praise. Now, the first words out of his mouth, you know, they aren't directed to his wife or his family or his newly born son. You know, he, notice he, he talk about all the things that he missed out on during those nine months. It wasn't any of those things. His first response is this eruption of, of this adoration, this, this desire to, to give praise, right? You know, and all the neighbors, those around him, they're, they're kind of filled with awe. And let me just kind of pause and take a, throw out this side note here. Because I think this is kind of a, a, neat, a neat thing. And, and I want us to make note of this because I, I do think it's, it's, it's rather amazing. You know, it's an amazing example of how God's discipline, okay? You know, remember, right? You know, because Zachari uh, Zachariah was like, I'm not believing this, I need proof, right? You know, so he's, he's kind of in doubt, and there's this, you know, this without speech kind of thing. And so this is an amazing example of how God's discipline doesn't always disqualify us from serving. Okay? And I want us to kind of to hear that because, you know, his time, Zachariah's time of silence wasn't, you know, it was really more of this, um, this act of mercy than, than judgment, it allowed him to, you know, time to regroup, to, to refocus, to repent. You know, so kind of going back to this eruption of praise, you know, I want us to take a look at this. Starting at verse 67, I'll read this for us because this is, you know, if you, if you look in your Bibles, most times you'll have this subheading and it says Zachariah's song. You know, and if I'm, you know, full disclosure here, you know, I'd read through this, not a big fan, want to get to the meat, you know, tell me about Jesus, I'm not really, 
really thrilled about Zechariah's song. I passed through it the first several times. I read Luke, you know. But there's, there's some amazing things here. Verse 67 starts out with, you know, his father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied. Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come to his people and redeemed them. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. As he said through his holy prophets of long ago, salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show mercy to our ancestors and to remember his holy covenant, the oath he swore to our father Abraham to rescue us from the hand of our enemies and to enable us to serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him, to give his people the knowledge of salvation through forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our God by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the path of peace. And the child grew and became strong in spirit, and he lived in the wilderness until he appeared publicly um, to Israel. <clears throat> you know, these words, this, um, this song, they're the result of this prophetic eruption of, of adoration you know, that spewed out from the lips uh, of Zechariah. And, and right before we read through these verses, right, you know, I, I shared that this was this amazing example of how God's discipline doesn't always disqualify us from serving. You know, his time, right, Zechariah's time, again, was, was really more of, you know, this understanding that God gave or presented this act of mercy. Right? And these words, I believe, are, are, are fruit of that mercy. You know, understanding these things, I, I like for us to switch gears a bit now. You know, because we, we did kind of begin kind of trying to unfold, taking a look at, at what was behind the story. But I want us to switch gears from that towards taking a look at what's inside the story. You know, through, through Zechariah's story, his life, I'd like for us to pull out a few examples. Examples of faith that I believe we can, we can learn from. And, and the first is this. You know, Zechariah had faith that in the right time, God hears and answers our prayers. In, Take a look at verse 13. I'll read that for us. It says, But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid. Zechariah, your, your prayer has been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you are to call him John. And I believe there's a practical application here for us. You know, check this out. And, 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 and you, let, me, let me share um, kind of a, some thoughts that I, I had from um, meeting with a local pastor in Louisville while I was in seminary. You know, I had asked him some questions. He had shared this in regards to um, our prayers, how we pray to God. You know, I was kind of asking him, you know, about God hearing and, and how does all that things work and and I wanted to get his take on it. And, and he shared this. He said, if our prayers, our request, right, you know, that, are, you know, that we intercede on behalf of others are being stored in heaven, it could be that our bowl of prayers, and he, and he kind of considered this this bowl, right? You know, we, we fire it up and, and, you know, it gets put in this bowl. But he says, you know, it could be that our bowl of prayers concerning any given person or need or situation is almost full and ready to be released on our behalf. 
They went on to say, I don't know how many prayers it takes to fill a bowl. He said, sometimes, but not usually, I'll pray once and, and things happen. God answers and he moves. But, but more often, however, it takes a continual asking, you know, seeking and knocking on behalf of myself and others. You know, all this to say that I believe that God hears our prayers. No doubt about that. He does. God hears our prayers. But he hears them, you know, he hears them on our time. But he answers them most definitely in his time. Okay? And, and I want us to, to, to hear that, right? He hears our prayers in our time. But he answers them in his. Now, this, is, this can be problematic for a lot of us because many of us, we have grown used to getting things our way. We have. You know, we, we like it our way. We, 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 we expect things our way. You know, and if you don't believe me, just try and kind of, you know, kind of think through some of the things. If you go to a restaurant, and the service takes a while. How many of you get a little flustered, you know? You know, especially maybe you might be a little bit hungry, right? You know, you get there, you know, and, and it'll be really polite, I think, at first. Like, man, you know, the service is sure they're taking a while here, you know? We, we, we might give it the benefit of while well, because it's a little crowded, right? You know, and then it takes a little bit longer. Then our... You know, our politeness may, may kind of shift, right? You know, because we might think, like, man, you know, what kind of, man, a service is terrible. Right? You know, and, and man, what's the deal? And I got to pay for this? And, and we, we start going through all of these things. Because we're used to the fact that I come, I sit down, they take my order within a certain amount of time, then magically food appears and I eat it, and then a bill comes and I pay it, and then I go on my merry way, right? You know, I mean, same is true with almost everything else. We, we like things the way we like them. You know, I, I kind of, I, I call it like this Burger King mentality. You know, although I'm a fan of McDonald's, Burger King tells you you can have it your way, right? And, and we want it our way. We like it our way. In fact, when it's not our way, we tend to get frustrated. You know, we, we tend to, to get upset. And you see, it's no different in our relationship with the Lord. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll bring a request to Him. And He hears it in our time. He hears our prayers, our requests. And because He doesn't answer it in our time, oftentimes, sometimes we feel like, man, why does He not hear me? I mean, we see it throughout the Psalms. David is kind of whining about that, man. You know, why? You know, when we don't feel heard, right? You know, we, we get frustrated, we get irritated, we feel abandoned. Let me ask this. Do we feel as if at times our requests go unheard? And if you feel that way, perhaps we can learn from Zechariah's example here and understand that God, He hears our prayers. And in the right time, He answers them. You know, another thing we can learn from Zechariah's story is that, you know, Zechariah had faith that God can do the incomprehensible. You know, take a look at verse 18. Again, it says, Zechariah asked the angel, 
How can I be sure of this? Remember, we, we, we just we read this earlier, right? You know, how can I be sure of this? You know, I'm an old man and my wife is well along in years. Okay, we talked about this earlier that, that both Zachariah and Elizabeth, they were kind of in their late 80s. And I'm not saying that nothing happens after 80, okay, because I... I you know, because I used to think that 50 was old, you know, and now that I'm, 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 I'm rocking 55, I'm thinking that, man, you know what, I, I keep telling my wife that I feel like I'm kind of like 50 is like the new 30, you know. She, she looks at me and thinks that something is wrong with me, but I still feel that way, right? You know, and so I, I, I just think that, you know, it's not, it's not, you know, life does not end at a certain age, right? So I'm, I'm not going to be one that's going to discriminate against that. <clears throat> but what I am saying is that I haven't come across anyone my age or older who is saying, hey, you know what, um, I'm thinking about starting a family, you know? I mean, when, when I hang out with, with, with my friends, right, you know, I mean, you know, my classmates that we grew up together, I mean, we, we're, we're talking about retirement, you know, like, okay, you know, when the, when the kids get out of the house, what that's going to look like, you know, what you, you know, in fact, I have a few of my friends who, who are already retired, you know, and so they're telling me how life is just, man, you know, they're just living it up, and, and, and so I can honestly say that, you know, at least in my experience, 55 and up, not, not a whole lot of people rocking the uh, start a new family conversation there, right, you know, and, and, and and I wouldn't even know even how to respond to that, right? You know, because I, I can't say no, but I can say that, man, I, I would not look forward to sleep deprivation. I, I, I remember those years, right? I remember, you know, thinking that, why? 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 What's wrong? You know, I mean, is this child possessed? I don't know. You know, I mean, I do not look forward to changing diapers. You know, it, or, or chasing down crawlers or walkers. I remember our, our house back then looked like a UFC cage. We caged up everything because, man, the girls would get into everything. So we had things all over the place and just gates all over, you know, and... and Man, I remember the time where we took down all those gates. Man, I just felt like liberated, you know? And, and, and so that those aren't the things that I, I, I remotely even think about, right? So they would be incomprehensible for me. But Zachariah and Elizabeth, they didn't have kids. They, they wanted to be parents at one time. And I'm guessing that by Zachariah's re response, they didn't think that this was still in the cards for them. They, they didn't think this was a possibility. And, and really, I think that many of us, we would probably share that mindset. You know, rather than kind of start this whole family thing, you know, maybe get a pet. I don't know, you know, but, but this is kind of the deal where where that was kind of the, the thing, the, the, the thought process that was going through. But he, God, can do the incomprehensible. He, God, can, can do things that we cannot even think possible. And Zachariah's faith was in God that he could do the incomprehensible. Let's kind of move on, and we'll kind of wrap it up at this point. You know, and, and although I believe there's much to unpack here in these verses, the final thing I want us to look at this morning from Zechariah's story is that Zechariah had faith that God is, is working even when we can't see it. You know, and I'm not going to reread it here, but this eruption of praise and adoration that we, we went through earlier, found in verses 67 to 80. We, we read a few minutes ago, it, it's this example of, of God's work in and through Zechariah's life. The other thing we need to understand is that this, these, these words found in those verses, they're not limited to just simply praise, 
but also prophecy. They're a prophetic word from Zechariah. He's, he's giving praise of things that are to come. Okay? Most of these he, he hasn't seen yet. You know, faith, he has this faith, faith in, in things that he can't see, things that has, you know, that he has yet to experience and beyond. I think that this is definitely something that many of us can, can learn from because I believe that we all experience troubles. You know, we, we, we all experience less than ideal situations when things may not go our way. And even in those trying situations, when we find ourselves in the midst of perhaps spiritual attack, you know, know that God, He's not, you know, out of the loop, nor is He out of control in the work of our lives. You know, Scripture tells us in Romans 8.28 that God can use all things and in all situations. Even less than ideal situations, even in trying situations, even when we can't see it. Take a look at Romans 8.20. I'll read that for us. It says, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. And with that said, let me just ask a question. You know, are, are there things in our lives that frustrate us because we just don't see it? Or we just, we just don't get it? You know, a decision that was made and we felt like we didn't have a say in it. You know, a direction, you know, work is going or, or our family is or whatever. And, and we just don't, we just can't connect the dots. And if you're there, you know, know that you aren't alone. And know that we can take comfort from Zechariah's faith in that God is working. You know, even when we can't see it. Let me wrap things up here. You know, as we, as we walk through the Christmas story, in the next few weeks leading up to Christmas Eve, you know, there, know that there are many other sub-stories going on. Stories that, that possess profound life lessons to be learned. And this morning we, we, we kind of, we took a look at a story of faith. And because I, I, I want to I want to leave us with a, a few questions just to, to think about, to ponder this week. <clears throat> you know, and, and the first is, how does Zechariah's story speak to us? How does it speak to you? How does it speak to me? <clears throat> you know, what, what's going on? How does this resonate in my life? The second one is this, how, how can we practice our faith like Zechariah this season. And the third is this, how, how do we share our story of faith with others? You know, during this time of the year, I, I think it's so neat because I do believe that for those of us who call ourselves followers of Jesus, children of God, it's this, it's this open-ended opportunity to share our story of faith because it's woven into the tapestry of the season that we celebrate. Let me pray for us. <clears throat> our Father, we are, again, we... We're grateful, God.
And this morning, we, we give you thanks for the life of Zechariah. And, and, and at times, man, it, it, it's just, it's hard to comprehend all the things that have gone on in his life. But, but Father, we're grateful for the lessons learned, for this story of faith. And Father, I pray specifically just for, for, our, for our community of faith here, God. And, and Father, in this season that we would, Lord, we would be able to, to live out our faith, to share our story with the community, a, a city, a world that so desperately needs to hear it. Father, I pray for divine appointments that you would set up in advance. Where all we have to do is show up and share our love of you. Again, we're grateful And we give you thanks. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
Thank you for worshiping with us today. And we, as we continue to go through our Christmas season, let's just stay in hope. Let's stand firm. And let's share the love of Jesus Christ with everyone. We hope to see you guys again next week. Thank you for worshiping with us in person and online. If you are in person, you are not excused.